Thank you for that. Welcome to this very special collaborative evening offered by Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Congregation and the First Unitarian Congregation of Toronto. My name is Dave Renzetti, and I'll be your service weaver this evening. Joining me in leading the service will be the Reverend Sean Newton and the Reverend Lynn Harrison from Toronto First, along with NUC's music director, Suzanne Mazares with the Angelic Spirit Choir and first music director, Dallas Bergen, and the First Unitarian Choir as well. Reverend Lynn will also be offering music for us tonight. Joe Strakowski will be our tech, sound technician this evening. Matt Rideout will be our Zoom technician and Gordon Thorne will be assisting them. Also a reminder to stay after service um, for refreshments in the cappuccino room between the two services. Our second service this evening will begin at nine o'clock. Now I invite you to join me in reading the opening words. Let us cast the circle of a sacred space here. Let us cast the circle of a cherished space here, a space of safety, a place of forgiveness, a place of love. If we want the world to change, we must craft in our space and in ourselves the teeth that grow out a different kind of love. A life of graciousness, a life of intelligence. Now, we have nowhere else to go, nothing else to do. So let us bring our hearts, minds, spirits together as one, we give greeting and gratitude for being with each other this evening. This is our threshold moment. Let's enter sacred space together. Our service begins now. And I would like to start by acknowledging the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, in the Mississauga of the New Credit, and all First Nations people who lived here before and who are living here now. I offer my gratitude to our First Nations for their care for and teachings about our Mother Earth and our relations to it. May we all work to honor these teachings. And now for the chalice lighting. It's a call and response. On this night, as we light our chalice, the symbol of faith. 
Make room in your heart for something new. Suspend disbelief for one night. Prepare for the possibility of magic and miracles, the presence of angels and camels and cows, sheep and shepherds suddenly surrounding us and asking us to join them in the stable, to gather in the dark of night, refusing to believe that we have seen it all before, unwilling to let fear keep us from following the star the bright light of hope, the good news of love that is born again this night, once more calling us to make the journey into the unknown, believing that together we can awaken the world to joy and justice, to kindness and to peace. Come, let us celebrate Christmas together. On behalf of First Unitarian, I want to express our deep gratitude to the neighborhood congregation for welcoming us by making room in your inn on this night of all nights, when our congregation would have otherwise not had a sanctuary. May our coming together be a blessing for both of our congregations this night. I'm going to invite Lynn Ford to help with, play with some fire, which we are not allowed to do in our current uh, <laughs> Collegiate Institute. This is very exciting for us. <laughs> In our Unitarian Universalist tradition, we draw on the wisdom of the world's great religions. On this night, as we honor our Christian heritage, we light the four candles of our Advent wreath, candles that have been burning these last few weeks in great anticipation of this night. The four candles represent peace, love, hope, and joy. And here at the great gate of winter, when the wheel of the year has moved us from the solstice fully now into winter, we light the three candles of our Yule log to celebrate the slow and certain return of the sun. The three candles represent the triple goddess tradition of maiden, mother, and crone. Thank you. 
For this evening's reading, I give you the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 to 20, the birth of Jesus. And it came to pass in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered for the purposes of taxation. The census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to their own city. Joseph went up from Galilee out, to the city of, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room at the inn. Now they were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said unto them, Do not be afraid, for behold, 
I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards all. So it was, when the angels had gone away, then into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known that the sayings which was told to them concerning this child, and all those who heard it marveled at these things, which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Our next reading comes from the writer W.H. Auden. If we fill our lives with things and yet more things, if we feel that we must fill every moment that we have with activity, when will we have the time to make the long, slow journey across the burning desert as did the wise men, or sit and watch the stars as did the shepherds, or brood over the coming of the child as did Mary? For each of us, there is a desert to travel, a star to discover and follow, and a being within ourselves to bring to life. Oh. 
angels and archangels may have gathered there. Cherubim and seraphim may have filled the air. But the mother only in her maiden bliss worshipped the We're now going to do a responsive reading. I'll read the first bit, and then you will read where the hyphen starts. How short the daylight hours have now become. How gray the skies, how barren seem the trees. But there is that in me which reaches up toward the light and laughter, bells and carolers. And the notes that I religious miss and the dream of newborn joy to goodness must be true. Because it speaks the truths of older myths. And babes are hope, and saviors of the world as miracles abound in common things. For so the children come, and so they have been coming, always the same way they come, born of love and human connection.
No angels herald their beginnings. No prophets predict their future courses. No wise men see a star to show where to find the babes that bring love to humankind. Yet each night a child is born is a holy night, loving parents holding their children close, glorying in the sight of new life beginning. They ask, what will be the journey of this new life? Each night a child is born. We come now to a time in our service when we offer our gifts in gratitude for all the ways we are sustained and nurtured in our congregations. Both neighborhood and first are places where we grow, find kindred spirits, and learn grace, kindness, tolerance. Tonight our financial gifts will be directed toward our home congregation through the offering baskets that will be passed around now for the ongoing maintenance and growth of our very special faith communities. If at all possible, please indicate which congregation your gift is for. Some of the envelopes say the neighborhood, but if you're from first, just scratch that out and write first. If you uh, use an envelope and give all your information, you, uh, you'll get a tax receipt for it. Um, un unnamed donations are also welcome, and those will be split 50-50 between the two congregations.
Thank you all so very much. I saw a lot of generosity out there this evening, and that's fantastic. Let this gift be a symbol of our commitment to one another, our commitment to our faith, and our commitment to our communities in this time of peace and love. Thank you very much, everyone. Our next reading is by Nancy Dahlberg, and it's called A Gift. It was Sunday, Christmas. Our family had spent the holidays with my husband's parents, but in order for us to be back at work on Monday, we found ourselves driving the 600 kilometers home on Christmas Day. But in order, sorry, and it is normally an eight hour drive, but with kids, it can be a 14 hour endurance test. When we could stand it no longer, we stopped for lunch in King City. This little metropolis is made up of six gas stations and three sleazy diners, and it was into one of these diners that the four of us trooped, road-weary and saddle-sore. As I sat, Eric, our one-year-old, in a high chair, I looked around the room and wondered, what am I doing in this place? The restaurant was nearly empty. We were the only family and ours, the only children. Everyone else was busy eating, talking quietly, aware perhaps that we were all somehow out of place on this special day when even the cynical paused to reflect on peace and goodwill. My reverie was interrupted when I heard Eric squeal and glee. Hi there, two words he thought were one. Hi there, he pounded his fat baby hands, whack, whack, on the metal high chair tray. His face was alive with excitement, eyes wide, gums bared in a toothless grin. He wriggled and chirped and giggled, and then I saw the source of his merriment, and my eyes could not take it all in at once. A tattered rag of coat, obviously bought by someone else eons ago, dirty, greasy, and worn. Baggy pants, both they and the zipper at half-mast over a spindly body, Toes that poked out of would-be shoes, a shirt that had a ring around the collar all over it, and a face like none other, gums as bare as Eric's, hair uncombed, unwashed, unbearable, whiskers too short to be called a beard, but way, way beyond a shadow, and a nose so varicose that it looked like a map. I was too far away to smell him, but I knew he smelled and his hands were waving in the air, flapping about on loose wrists. Hi there, baby. Hi there, big boy. I see you, you buster. My husband and I exchanged a look that was a cross between what do we do and poor devil. Eric continued to laugh and answer, hi, hi there. Every call was echoed. I noticed waitresses' eyebrows shoot to their foreheads, and several people sitting near us hemmed <clears throat> out loud. This old man was creating a nuisance with my beautiful baby. I shoved a cracker at Eric, and he pulverized it on the tray. I whispered, why me, under my breath. Our meal came, and the cacophony continued. Now the guy was shouting from across the room, do you know patty cake? boy. Do you know peekaboo? Hey, look, he knows peekaboo. Nobody thought it was cute. The guy was drunk and a disturbance. I was embarrassed. My husband, Dennis, was humiliated. Even our six-year-old said, why is that man talking so loud? We ate in silence, all except Eric, who was running through his repertoire for the admiring applause of this man on Skid Row. Finally, I had enough, and I turned the high chair. Eric screamed and clambered around to face his old buddy. Now I was mad. Dennis went to pay the check, imploring me to get Eric and meet him in the parking lot. I trundled Eric out of the high chair and looked towards the exit. The man sat poised and waiting, his chair directly between me and the door. Lord, just let me get out of here before he speaks to me or Eric. I bolted for the door. It soon became obvious, though, that both the Lord and Eric had other plans. As I drew closer to the man, I turned my back, walking to sidestep him and any air he might be breathing. As I did so, Eric, all the while with his eyes riveted to his best friend, 
leaned far over my arm, reaching out with both arms in a baby's pick-me-up position. In a split second of balancing my baby and turning to counter his weight, I came eye to eye with the old man. Eric was lunging for him, arms spread wide. The man's eyes both asked and implored, would you let me hold your baby? There was no need for me to answer, since Eric propelled himself from my arms to the man's. Eric laid his tiny head upon the man's ragged shoulder. The man's eyes closed, and I saw tears hover beneath his lashes. His aged hands, full of grime and pain and hard labor, gently, so gently, cradled my baby. I stood awestruck. The old man rocked and cradled Eric in his arms for a moment, and then his eyes opened and sat squarely on mine. He said in a firm and commanding voice, you take care of this baby. Somehow I managed I will from a throat that contained a stone. He pried Eric from his chest, unwillingly, longingly, as though he was in pain. God bless you, ma'am. You've given me my Christmas gift. I said nothing more than a muttered thanks. With Eric back in my arms, I ran for the car. Dennis wondered why I was crying and holding Eric so tightly, and why I was saying, my God, oh God, forgive me.
And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Be not afraid, behold. For my money, the angel, I think, really nails it. The angel, you know, and the glory shining all around makes the timeless connection that exists between our fear and our capacity for amazement, between what scares us and what wondrous things we are able to witness. Sometimes, of course, these are very much the same thing. Sometimes what frightens us can also be what touches and transforms us. Be not afraid, behold. Now that's easier said than done, especially I'm guessing for an angel of the Lord. When we mere mortals are gratefully, greatly afraid, there's often very little room left in our lives for wonder. It can be hard to believe whenever we are feeling full of fear that somehow glad tidings of joy are just about to break out all around. Yet fear and wonder are so intimately woven together in our world and in our lives. The one tiny word in the English language that captures the connection between them is the word awe, that feeling of deep reverence that can be caused by fear or wonder or both. There is an art to living this way, of living in a sacred state of awe, of being routinely awe-struck, of basking in life's beauty and its blessings while being mindful and maybe fearful knowing that precious things can be lost, that things change, and that nothing lasts forever. The poet reminds us that it is a fearful thing to love what can be lost, connection, relationships, life itself. And yet this is the grand bargain of being alive, that everything is on loan, a gift given to us only for a time. And somehow this sacred bargain asks, that we not be afraid and instead behold the wonder of it all. Now it would be admittedly very helpful if we had an angelic choir to follow us around, hint, hint, <laughs> ready to burst into song at any moment, reminding us to do just that, to not be afraid and behold. Now I don't believe that being not afraid is the same thing as being free of fear. Rather, it is about being free from fear's grip on us so that we can open ourselves more fully to each present moment with whatever it may bring and bask in the complicated glory of it all. To live with genuine awe in all of its awesome, awful, awe-filled meaning. The natural tension between fear and wonder is at the heart of being human. In that tension exists so much of what we love in this life the powerful experience some people report when they bring a child into the world or when they make the leap of faith into a commitment or follow a bold new direction or when they come to bid farewell at the end to those whom they love. Moments all of deep connection between feelings of fear and feelings of wonder. Moments when we can't completely grasp whether our tears are those of joy or sorrow or some bittersweet blend of both. Moments that are filled with awe in its truest sense. Moments that hopefully help us feel fully alive. Such is the great glad tiding that I believe comes to us from that place of awe, that place where fear and wonder meet. That what we most fear is tied to our worry about losing something we most love. So be not afraid. Behold. Or put another way, don't miss out on what is wondrous because you are afraid of what might be lost. Behold what can happen and wonder at what is possible when we act in spite of our fears. That's what I loved most about the story I shared a moment ago. It was the child who led with wonderment, ready to reach out and forge connection beyond his parents' fears and judgment. His little simple hi there was determined to build a bridge to overcome the distance between him and the man. 
Because he was unafraid, he opened his own mother's heart, calling her back to the better person she wanted and knew herself to be. Behold. That little boy named Eric wasn't the first baby in history to do that, and he certainly won't be the last. Indeed, the awe that rightly accompanies the birth of every child has the power to change hearts the world over for good. Of course, the enduring story that we gather to celebrate this night is but one of history's most compelling examples. When those shepherds abiding in the fields with their flocks heard the happy news, they went with haste to share what they had learned. May we do likewise. May we open our hearts to the inbreaking of wonder in this season and let it at least temper our fears. May the glory that we witness inspire us to cherish life and those we love even more. May it empower us to reach out to others in compassion and understanding, becoming messengers of love and light. May it encourage us to become angels in our own right, calling out to others to be not afraid, but to behold the glory that is shining all around. Blessed be. In this moment of beauty and stillness, pause for a moment to nourish your spirit. Breathe in the warmth of community, kinship, and love. Let this moment bring healing and peace to you in the midst of a world so seldom at peace and in times that are as complicated as they are meaningful. In a few moments, we will join together in singing a simple song that has brought peace to human hearts for hundreds of years. Beginning with the light of a single candle, we will pass the flame from one person to another holding up our single candles bravely against the darkness, that their lights may mingle together and illuminate all of our lives. As the candles are lit and then as we all sing Silent Night, I will ask that you hold your lit candle. We will hold it for a moment after the song is sung and then Sean will come and offer a blessing to us all. And then when the lights return, that will be the moment when we can gently, very gently, extinguish our candles, bringing our candle lighting service or our candle lighting ceremony to an end before the rest of, of our service tonight. Tonight, may the candles we hold be symbols of love, faith, and renewal and may they rekindle hope and joy in each and every one of our hearts this night 
and every night. Let's lift our lights in the hope of peace. I invite you into these words of blessing. Spirit of life, spirit of Christmas, we have come this sacred night from many places, having traveled great distances through the days of our lives to stand near to the manger once again, hoping for a glimpse over angels' wings and shepherds' shoulders of the mystery and the miracle of it all. 
We come with hope in our hearts, a hope that the world around us might be different, a hope that we ourselves might be changed, a hope for a peace and goodwill that endures around the globe and to the end of time. But let us not leave this place without learning anew that the hope of the world lives not only in a newborn babe, but in each of our hearts. If only we will give them over to the inbreaking power and spirit of love. May it be so. May it be so for us all. In the name of all that is holy and sacred on this silent night. Amen. I invite you to be mindful with the wax in your new chairs. benediction comes from the great Howard Thurman. When the song of angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home and the shepherds are back with their flocks, then the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace to the earth, and to make music in the heart.
tradition around here at Neighborhood where we hold hands at the end of ceremony and we say the simple word, Namaste. Namaste is a greeting very common in Asia and it simply means, I salute the spirit in you. So, Neighborhood and First Church, Namaste. namaste. And perhaps we could turn to the camera behind us and say to them, Namaste. Merry Christmas to all the night.